Hey everybody, I hope you're all doing well, and welcome back to our image processing series. In this video, we're going to be finishing up our faster convolution, so this is going to be the part two to that part one, and we're actually going to be using the DFT2D and IDFT2D functions that we made last video in order to actually perform convolution. So let's get right into that. Before I get into this video, if you haven't watched our previous video, I recommend you check it out because it discusses a convolution theorem, which we're going to be needing for this video as well. So if you haven't seen the previous part to this video, make sure you check that out first. Or if you already know the convolution theorem, you should be good for this video. So you can just stick around here. Anyway, let's get into the code now. So before we make the actual convolution functions, we're going to need some helper functions. So the first helper function I'm defining here is going to be the pointwise product. And if you remember from the convolution theorem, the pointwise product is very important. That's what we're going to be using once we take the DFT of both our kernel and our image. And speaking of the DFT, notice that the algorithm from the last video only works when the width and height are powers of two. So we're also going to need some sort of padding function that will help us pad the kernel. And the reason we're just doing the kernel is because we're actually going to pad the image inside the convolution function. So let's just also define a pad kernel function here. So the implementation for the pointwise product function is fairly simple. All we have to do here is loop through the length L and for each point in the length L, we just take the product of a at that point times b at that point and put it inside of p at that point. And so that's it for that function. Now we can move on to the pad kernel function. And for the pad kernel function, we actually need to pad this in a special way. So the first thing is we're going to pad it with zeros until the height is the same as ph and the width is the same as pw. But on top of that, we need to pad the kernel so that the center of the kernel is in the first row and first column and that anything to the left or above that center row and center column gets wrapped around to the bottom right side of the image. So I'm going to put a picture up right now. This is kind of how we have to pad the kernel. As you can see the actual kernel elements are kind of on the corners of the padded kernel and in between in the middle there's kind of a cross which is all zeros. This picture was in a paper by Victor Podlozniak so I'll put the link to that in the description and it has a lot of good information about convolution so I recommend you all check it out. Anyway, for the implementation of this, we're going to want to loop through the kernel similar to how we did in our original convolution video. So we're going to start our looping with i at negative cr and then loop until we reach the other side of the kernel. So that's while i is less than the kernel height minus cr. And that's for looping over all of the rows. For looping over all the columns, we're basically going to do the same thing except with cc for the center column and kernel width instead of kernel height. Then we're going to define this variable r, which is actually going to go in the outer loop. And this is going to be the resulting row inside of the pad kernel where we should put the current kernel element that we're on. And we're going to do the same thing for this variable c, which is going to be the resulting column where the current kernel element should go. And then all we have to do at the end of the inner loop here is just set pad kernel r times the pad width plus c equal to a new complex number, which is going to hold the kernel element in the real part of that complex number. So we can access that kernel element by doing i plus cr times kernel width and then adding on j plus cc. And that's going to be it for the pad kernel function there. So now we can finally move on to our convolution function. So let's go back to image.h and we'll copy our old convolutions. And the only thing we're going to change is a name here because they're actually going to take all the same parameters. And then we can go back over to the .cpp file to start making the definitions. So we'll just paste in all of these functions here. One thing I'm going to quickly do is just move all of our old convolution functions up in the .cpp file just to correspond with where they are in the .h file. And then we can start off with defining our clamp to zero function. So let's do that one first. One of the first things we have to do here is pad. And in order to pad, we first need to calculate what size to pad to. 
So we'll calculate the pad width here by taking two to the power of the ceiling of the log base two of the width plus the kernel width minus one. And the reason we have width plus kernel width minus one is because we wanna have enough space to fit the image and for the kernel to overhang. And we also need it to be a power of two for our FFT function. So that's why we have to have all those math functions there. And then we're basically gonna do the same thing for the pad height, except it's gonna be with the height and kernel height. And then I'm just gonna define this little variable P size here, which is just gonna be the product of the pad width and pad height. And this will just be useful because we're gonna to have to use the product of the pad width and pad height a couple times in this function. Next up, we'll do our actual padding. And why don't we pad the image first? So we're gonna create a complex double array to hold the padded image. And all we're gonna do here is loop through the normal image size. So we get that by accessing the data field of our image struct. And since the pad image array of complex doubles initializes to zero automatically, we only have to fill the parts in the top left corner of the pad image with our data array elements. Next, we can pad our kernel, and for that, we just use the handy-dandy function we just created, and then we can do our actual convolution. So to do that, we're just gonna take the two-dimensional DFT of both the pad image and pad kernel, and then we can just calculate the point-wise product of the pad image and pad kernel, and I store that back into the pad image, and then we just take the IDFT 2D of the pad image, and again, I store that back into pad image. So that's basically the entire convolution algorithm. All I have to do now is put it back into the data field of our image struct. And to do that, we basically do the reverse of the original padding step of the image. However, when going back here, I have to have these extra rounding, casting, and byte bounding steps to avoid having a pixel value outside of the range zero to 255. So that's pretty much it for that function. Why don't we go test it over in main? So let's delete all of this old code and these old functions at the top up here. And let me just bring up this code from the bottom, which just includes the creation of an image, a couple kernels, and then a little section at the bottom that we'll get to in a minute. So the first piece of code we're gonna write here is just us copying the image test into two other images. So we're gonna copy the image test into this image called CSTD and one called CFD. And then basically we're just gonna call the convolve function using one of the kernels that we defined up above. And I messed up a little bit while typing here, so there are a couple errors in the code, but we'll go back and fix those in a minute, just bear with me. So now at the bottom, this little bit of code actually comes into play. And basically what this does is it copies CSTD into diff and then puts into diff the diff map between CSTD and CFD. And then basically we just go through there and see if there were any differences between the outputs of the two different convolutions. And basically if the difference is more than one, then we're gonna consider that to be a non-negligible error because as you know, we did have to do some rounding, so there is a chance that there's a rounding error. And if it turns out that we get through this test without any prints from this loop, then we know that the only differences in our two images are gonna be due to rounding errors and we can consider our function a success. All right, so let's go ahead and test and we know we're gonna get a couple of errors here. So the first main one is that I forgot to uncomment this include of image test. The second one is gonna be that I forgot to put a star for pointer next to the type on these array declarations. The third is that I forgot to put a equal sign when I was filling the pad image array with elements from the data field. And the last one is that I forgot to actually call our new method of convolution on CFD rather than just calling the standard one. So now we're ready to run our actual test. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try it first with the embossing kernel that we tested on last time. So I'm just gonna adjust the convolution functions here. And as you see, our images were written. And if you look at the con check file that we write to at the end of main, you can see that it's 
completely black, which for us meant that there were no differences. And we also didn't see anything printed. So it looks like that one's working. Let's test it next on the Gaussian blur. So you can see there's a blur and there are some things here in the con check file, but notice nothing was printed. So those differences are less than one. Basically they amount to just rounding errors. And lastly, let's check with this box blur. So this box blur is a little bit of a bigger kernel. It's going to be considered to be 16 by 16. And as you can see, that's quite the blur there. And there are some rounding errors in this one as well. But notice again, nothing was printed. So it looks like these functions are working perfectly fine. Next thing we're going to test here is the speed of our functions. So I'm just going to add these timing variables around the convolution blocks. And I'm going to add a print statement to print out how many nanoseconds each method of convolution took. So if we quickly run this with the box blur that we just ran it on, if you look at the amount of nanoseconds each method took, you'll notice that the new method of convolution is in fact faster. However, if we run it on the Gaussian blur kernel, which in this case is a much smaller kernel, we're going to see that the standard method is actually faster in this case. And the reason for this is because the kernel and the image as well are pretty small. So the speed up from using the FFT and you know pointwise multiplication is not enough for all the overhead we have to do to set it up. Because remember, we have to do padding, we have to take the FFT and inverse FFT, which all takes time. And in the case of small images and small kernels, it's really not worth it. So we'll come back to that in a second, but what I want to do right now is put the definitions for these other two convolution functions that we have here. So that would be clamp to border and cyclic. So for clamp to border and cyclic, the only thing that's going to be changed is how we pad the image. So when we pad the image for clamp to border, we're going to create these two helpful variables R and C. And what R and C are going to represent is which row and column the current value we're looping on goes into in our pad image. And I'm not going to explain specifically here why I'm choosing R and C specifically in this way. But basically the goal of choosing it in this way is because when we do convolution with FFT, it always performs a cyclic convolution. So we have to pad it in different ways depending on whether we want to do clamp to zero, cyclic, or clamp to border. And if you're more interested in that, definitely check out the paper I referenced earlier, which will be in the description. We're basically going to do the same thing for the cyclic convolution, except this time we're going to define R and C a little bit differently. Again, if you're interested in that, check the description for that link to the paper. It explains everything super well and it has pictures. Also, if you want the code, make sure you check the description for our GitHub link. It's going to link to this entire image processing project, which has every single function we've made so far. All right, so now that we've made those other two convolution functions, we can go back to main and quickly test them. I'm just going to quickly run them here to show you all that these functions actually work. And after that, there's one last thing that I want to do. So at least on my computer, what I've noticed is once I get to a kernel size of around 15 by 15, it becomes beneficial to use our new method of convolution. So I'm just going to define some new functions here whose sole purpose is going to be to choose whether to use our new method of convolution or the old method of convolution based on the kernel size. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. However, for this simple library, it's going to be okay to just have something simple like this. So for the definition here, all I'm doing is checking if the kernel width times kernel height is greater than 224. And if that's the case, I'm going to use our new method of convolution. And if not, we're just going to use the old one. And the 224 just comes from 15 by 15. So basically 15 by 15 is 225. So if we have more data points in that in our kernel, then we're using the new method. If not, we're going to use the old method. So now we can quickly test these functions. And I just want to point out that I named one of the functions convolve linear rather than convolve clamp to zero. And it turns out that those two names are actually interchangeable. They both mean the same thing. So don't get too hung up on that. You can name them one or the other if you want to. I believe the more common one is linear though.
anyway, as you can see, these functions are all working, so that concludes this video. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next image processing video.